So what I did, and that led to the greatest gains in bench press I've ever had, okay, was top half, close grip bench. So obviously heavier than my, my, normal, my, my normal weight for three reps. Then on the dips, going to the, the lowest possible position and doing balances. Mm. I, I keep pulling myself down to initiate a stretch reflex and just rebound and down and rebound and up. I would rebound and pull myself down like aggressively. Like I'm not sure my shoulders could handle it right now, but aggressively. Dude, I got so freaking strong so fast. That was Christian Thibodeau, and you're listening to the Just Fly Performance Podcast. If there's one thing that has completely changed my approach to supplementation, it's been finding performance herbalism. Herbalism is different than your typical supplements, particularly because herbalism works by harnessing the power of nature. It involves using tried and tested, high-grade, well-sourced herbal compounds to make a difference in your energy, strength, boost your hormonal system, and improve your overall vitality. That's what today's sponsor, Lost Empire Herbs, can bring to you. Whether it's through Shiliajit Resin, which has been highly recommended by many coaches for improved strength, mushroom tinctures for immune support, combination packages such as the Phoenix Formula, which is one of my favorites, Lost Empire Herbs has the supplements that will help you in achieving your performance training goals. If you want to check out some of my favorite herbs, you can head to lostempireherbs.com slash justfly and use the code JOEL15 at checkout. That's J-O-E-L-1-5 at checkout for 15% off. Lost Empire Herbs is a great company, and I hope you get a chance to check them out. Welcome to another episode of the podcast, and thanks for tuning in. I'm excited to welcome back to the show Christian Thibodeau. Christian is a Canadian strength coach with over two decades of experience, is a prolific author, and has worked with athletes from nearly 30 sports. Christian is the originator of training systems such as the neurotyping system and Omni Contraction Training. I always enjoy having Christian on the show. He's been a guest many times throughout this podcast series and the notes and pages of uh, show notes that I've written, uh, my conversations with him have really helped me in my own coaching and training journey. And on the show today, he'll be talking about many aspects of training. Uh, a major topic will be recovery, neurological recovery and stress and how it impacts how we look at the time in between uh, competitive and training seasons. He'll be talking about uh, pre-fatigue, ex more extensive muscle work, and the potentiation that can come from that end of things, and how we can actually even work that into speed and power training. He'll be talking about loaded stretching for strength. Uh, this and much more on the show today. It's always fantastic talking to Christian, and I know you guys will enjoy this one. Let's get on to the show. Christian, it's awesome to have you back on the show. I, I wanted to let you know, too, the last show or last year, you talked about your friend who did the seasonal training. It was like, you know, powerlifting in the winter, Olympic lifting in the spring, track in the summer. So I followed that quite a bit last year. My winter was actually a lot more sandbags because I did a podcast with Julian Pinot. So it was a lot of sandbag. And then the spring was a little bit more Olympic. And, but I did a version of that. And it was awesome. I mean, I, it's something that especially like I'm 40 now. And I really mm -hmm. take that uh, to mind or to heart. Um, and I was curious with you, if you have any thoughts on like how you, you know, in Canada, obviously the seasons are like, you know, winter is like, you know, full blown up there. So I'm curious if you do anything season. seasonally. We have, we have two seasons. We have winter and then two weeks of summer. That's pretty much it. Uh, actually, I, it's funny you mentioned that because I, I just wrote another article on that exact topic, but slightly different application. And I do give more uh, precise and specific uh, programming recommendations for, for each block. Uh, now, uh, I, I would uh, in Canada and Quebec. Well, you need to keep in mind that the the, the friend of mine who, who used this program is from Quebec, so he he isn't under the same situation. Although, what is good for him is that he does have access to a full indoor facility. But but when you think about it, um, that that's why the seasons were organized this way, the, the original way, which was uh, like bodybuilding in, in the autumn, then powerlifting. In uh, the winter, then you have uh, Olympic lifting slash throwing because yeah, I, I, I prefer to see it as training like a drawer. Uh, I think it, it's more applicable to the general population or, or the average person than full on Olympic weightlifting training. And then summer when when it's nice out, then you can start doing more sprints and stuff like that with track and field training. So so it's actually based on what we can do in Quebec. Uh, now what I like to do is to make sure that that's why I, I move 
more toward like a drawer style workout in, in uh, the spring so that you can start to implement more jumping, uh, more agility work, uh, some slar- uh, short sprints so that when you move on to the summer and track season or the track type of training, then you're not going from, from scratch and then you're going to, which would lead to uh, injury while sprinting, right? So you're still ready to do explosive work. And the way it's set up is pretty cool because like the body, you start with the bodybuilding, so you build some muscle, muscle which you will put to good use during the power lifting section, which is winter. And that builds the nervous system's capacity to handle and perform during the power section, which is the tour weightlifting section, which builds the foundation for the sprinting. Of course, it will not optimize performance for any of these specific form of training because you have essentially one training cycle, 12 weeks for each type of training. But the way it's built, then if you do that sequence from a, a, a holistic body development, it, it will lead to very, very favorable changes in body composition, strength, and performance overall. Yeah, I remember that brings me back now that I'm thinking about it to this is probably not, this wasn't the exact format, but I remember the, my best year of track and field where I jumped seven feet and set like a four foot uh, record and triple jump. One of the things that uh, I remember was the fall was a lot more throws. Like you were talking about throws. So my fall was a lot more like backwards overhead shot put for distance and all that stuff. And then once the winter hit and, and I had like conversations with my, I mean, I had like my coach and I bust out like the Tudor Bampa books and we we're going over all the phases and all this stuff. And so it was the winter where I was really busting out like the reactive plyos, like single leg hurdle hops, really high single leg hurdle hops. And then that kind of went to the shelf for the spring and actually set my PR in the spring. And further along, I remember my, I started to get like, um, it might've been like a pre-stress fracture, my takeoff. Like it was almost like too far. Like if I did plyos all year, that probably would have overloaded my shin even quicker almost. So it was nice to have that like throws, then the really intense plyo block and then the sprinting and competition block or whatnot. And the reality is that when we are talking about training methods that are focused on neurological changes. Uh, which would be pretty much all power training methods, uh, reactive training, plyometrics, throws, even the Olympic lifts, and even strength training as far as in the very low range, ranges or isometric stuff like that. They all have a very short duration of what effective training can be. So mm. basically, it means that the first four weeks can have pretty dramatic gains. Then it, it, you still have progress for maybe three or four more weeks, but it's much, much, much slower then it pretty much is, there's no progress. So if you just keep doing that and doing that and doing that, you, you are just risking injuries and probably neurological fatigue with pretty much no benefit. So I believe that these methods, if anything, they should be probably cycled in for four, maybe six weeks. If you don't get the benefits in, that you're looking for in that time frame, uh, you probably do not have the proper foundation. You're not ready for that training method yet, so you should probably reevaluate how you program. Yeah, it's it is interesting to think about too, like the those shifting, like the the neurological system and output, but it does rely on having the structural abilities to sustain said outputs. And how long can you keep up a certain level without having that backing of it all? That's correct. That's correct. So you so you really need, and I think that that's probably the biggest problem with the wider access to information about the more advanced training method, right? We, we all, I mean, guys like you and I, we, are, we live for the most advanced training methods possible. We want to find out what will give me the most powerful stimulus right now. The reality is that we do understand that if someone is not physiologically or neurologically in the proper, at the proper level to m- take advantage of that method, it can actually backfire. But the, the average person just reads about those methods. Dude, I want to get fast. I'm going to use that best method. That's the most advanced. Like when Jay Schroeder burst out on the scene at first, like everybody wanted to do Jay Schroeder stuff. But but Archuleta had been training, preparing, pre, uh, pre, uh, building his foundation, uh, building his tissue, his tendons for years before you would get to the more advanced stuff. Then people want to do the more advanced stuff when they did not spend the time building the base. And that's true for every single method, including my own, is that yeah, we write about them because that's what we find cool right now. That's what we've been researching with advanced athletes or, or, or very high-level people. 
But if the average Joe or the lower level athlete say, dude, that's the best method, that screw this beginner shit, right? I want to do the <laughs> big, big kahuna of creating methods, but your body is not ready for it. So yes, it's powerful, but it can traumatize the tissue so much that it can actually backfire. Because even okay, pain, pain, discomfort, all those signals are what causes the most neurological inhibition. Okay? Neurological inhibition is a weakening of the central drive sent to the muscle and the muscle fire and contract and produce force and speed. All right? So if you have a weaker signal being sent, you can't recruit the fast twitch fibers as well. They are called high threshold motor units for a reason. They require a high threshold of neurological signal, right? So if you create central fatigue, which is a weakening of that central drive, you make it almost impossible to take advantage of the fast twitch fibers you have. Now, the biggest inhibitory signal are called FRM signals, basically signals or messages of pain, discomfort, or effort being sent from the muscle, the fascia, the tendons, even the skin to the brain to tell you, dude, what you're doing is freaking hard and it's dangerous for my, my well-being, so I'm going to stop you from doing it, right? That's a protective mechanism. Now, if you are structurally sound, like you are from a tendon, a fascia, a muscle, a bone perspective, ready for the level of stress you're using in training, you can handle that pretty well. But if your body is not ready, what happens is you're creating lots of low-grade systemic inflammation. You are causing stress on those tissues. And you don't always feel the pain, but it's still there, and it still sends signal to your brain, which will create inhibition, preventing you from performance, from performing at your best. Uh, and that's why I think that uh, not only... Okay, yeah, yeah, sure, you can get injured by using training methods that are too powerful for you. But the biggest problem is that your body will actually shut itself down when you're using a method that causes too much systemic stress. So, and you might not even notice that you're not getting the most out of training method because you still feel fine, but that doesn't mean there's no underlying problem. Yeah, I like the, I've always found myself wondering on days where I walk in the gym, you know, I go to do a jump or a sprint or something. It, it's just, you know, it's just not there, like the power or whatever. And you, sometimes you find yourself thinking, what exactly caused this? You know, was it, it you know, and maybe it's a lot of things, right? Maybe it's also life stress, but you also wonder what in my body is causing my brain to downregulate the signaling. Even recently, I, I, I've been doing, um, so I've done the tap test for a little tap the space bar or whatever, you know, as many times as you can the different nervous system tests, there's an interesting version out now that actually gives you um, like how many, you're basically the, the burst pattern, like where you burst of five, burst to six, burst of four. And I find that if your nervous system is a little bit trashed, it appears to be so far at least the, the, you can't sustain the bursts as long. It's like your da, da, da is, it's less sustainable. So something's happening where your nervous system's like, no, we're just going to give you this. I'm just going to give you four bursts, not five. <laughs> Anyways, I always find myself thinking about, uh, or, or oftentimes when those workouts do happen, I find myself thinking about what physiologically led to that. And, you know, so the inflammation, the, the micro inflammation or low grade inflammation, I hadn't really, I had never put in those words before. Yeah. And the, the, the problem is because central fatigue, just because we call it central, people assume that it is connected with feeling fatigue. And none at all. There is literally no correlation. You can actually be feeling absolutely amazing, then you go in the gym and, and it's not there because neurologically speaking, you just don't have that horsepower. And, and there's a lot of, again, underlying, could be any unresolved tissue fatigue. It could be any uh, unresolved muscle damage because the thing with muscle damage is uh, you actually become desensitized to that pain sensation. I mean, ask, mm. uh, let's say someone who starts lifting, right? They get super sore from any workout, basically. But when is the last time you got sore? When's the last time I got sore? I mean, I get tender, I get maybe a bit stiffer, but true debilitating muscle soreness, I can't remember. And I've done some crazy workouts in the past year. Uh, there's The more advanced you are, it's not that the muscle damage won't happen. It's that you make yourself resistance 
resistant to that pain signal. You don't perceive it as, as painful. If you work in a factory, at first, when you work there, the noise is deafening. It's, it's aggressive. It, it really messes with, with you. But after a few months of this, the noise is still there. You can still hear it, but it doesn't bother you as much. Same thing with pain. So if you have uh, muscle damage, if you are constantly imposing muscle damage on your body because you always train, it, it can still be there, but you don't actually feel the soreness that much. Uh, so that, can, that doesn't mean that there will, will be no inhibition in the nervous system because those signals still make it to the brain. They can still create neurological inhibition, which will reduce the strength of a signal, reducing performance. And that's one of the factors. And I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, we probably don't know half of it. Mm -hmm, yeah. I know for sure that many other neurotransmitters play a role. For example, glutamate level. It's been shown that when you are uh, entering what we would call an overtrained state, right, or, or chronic fatigue state, uh, glutamate levels rise up. Then you become higher and higher and higher. Uh, what that does, it actually makes you more sensitive to pain more sensitive to discomfort. Uh, it also obviously makes you less resilient in your training, and it shifts your mindset to be a bit less competitive, less aggressive. Because if you perceive more pain, automatically mm. performance will go down. So, so that one, and when you have a deload, then the glutamate will go down, GABA will go up, and now you're more resilient because you don't have those inhibition. In mm. So that one more thing, I uh, adrenergic sensitivity. How sensitive are the different tissues to your own adrenaline? I mean, there was a Dr. Fry conducted a study in 2015 on excessive quote unquote weight training. Uh, what they did was for two weeks, they had a, a group of weightlifters uh, train like Bulgarians. So basically maxing out every single day. What they noticed is that after two weeks of this, their response to their own adrenaline was diminished by close to 40%. Mm. So, so when that happens, when you understand that adrenaline from a neurological perspective is responsible for neurological activation, uh, making you more competitive, more driven, uh, but also increasing the speed of the, of the signal to the muscle. At the muscle level, it increases muscle tone, the speed of contraction, force of contraction. And at the cardiovascular level, it increases uh, the, the contraction strength of the heart and the capacity to elevate heart rate, so delivery of blood and oxygen to the muscles. So, so if you make yourself 40% more resistant to your own adrenaline or less responsive, then even if you're not feeling bad, you just can't turn the engine on. I mean, you, you might go up to 2,000 RPM rather than three or 4,000 RPM. You might not notice the difference, but there's certainly a big difference in performance capacity. Yeah, it's, that reminds me, and what you're talking about, um, I think about Sam Wiest, uh, who was recently on the show talking on longevity. One thing he talked about was in master's track athletes, how the best master's track athletes, like in their 50, 40s, 50s, 60s or beyond, a lot of them didn't either didn't do track when they were younger or they took like a big break. Like they, they went and they took like a 10 year break or something or whatever. And then they got back into it. And I, I was thinking about, um, I think I was watching a documentary. I'm on super happy you say that because <laughs> I'm taking a break from Olympic weightlifting for 22 years. So that's going to be great again. Yeah. You're, yeah. Let me keep me informed on how that goes. I, I was going to say, too, I saw um, even like Dara Torres, uh, who was in the Olympics for sprint swimming at like 41 or 42 years old. And I think she might have even like been close to making the team like in the next Olympics. I think she took several breaks, like like one or two year like breaks. And back when I was at Cal, Anthony Irvin was training there quite often and he won the gold medal in the 50 free at age 35 so he was like the oldest guy to win that and he had taken a multi-year break somewhere in his mid to late 20s i think it was and so it's but as you're talking it's almost like you think about well what does it take to be a great athlete firing up the system to put down the things that are trying to hold you back and that does come at some level of a cost and i, the, I remember I, I saw this a long time ago charlie francis had said something about like every sprinter, if they don't take every seventh year or something like that, like low volume, like at a like lot lower, then it was hard to continue progress. And then somewhere later, I saw a research, it was either a research or a book where it said like adrenal fatigue, uh, there's different you know opinions on adrenal fatigue. What is it? But it was something like seven years of stress with the adrenal glands can mess up your adrenal that system seven or something years like that. Period seems to be pretty common. Yeah in human nature, because just from a psychological perspective, mm. I mean, many, there's a 
I, I wouldn't say school of thought, but there are several psychologists who talk in terms of you function in seven years cycles. That's where like a relationship, like seven years for a long relationship, seven years is like the breaking point. So yeah. at, after seven years, oh, yeah. if you make, you're going to make mm-hmm. it for, 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 for like seven more years, then 14 years. It's seven years seems to come back quite a lot when it comes to handling different types of stress. I don't know why. I haven't read any science about it. It's certainly something that I will look into in the future, but it does seem to be recurrent. Yeah. I always kind of wondered how some of those coaches, I mean, when you read that too, like I read that when I was like 22. So it's like, it's kind of like trying to look outside the bottle when you're in the bottle. You're like, I have no idea. I've barely even trained. You know, I, I mean, I'd been training pretty hard even up till that point, but I certainly hadn't coached anyone for seven years, let alone starting to look at any of these trends. And so I always found it interesting how coaches could say that like, and feel definitive in that. And, you know, how do you, but I'm sure, you know, you train enough athletes and you monitor things like that. But, but I guess the question would be then, is it optimal to find ways around that? Or should you genuinely take like a year, be like, all right, this year, just go play golf or <laughs> you know, I don't know, like half the time or something, or I guess it's different for everybody too, you know, but. My answer would be, if, because that's the way my brain is wired it would be to have many different activities. So for example, mm-hmm. you have a big goal, which would be, it could be like competing at the world championship, Olympic, whatever, and you plan your cycle for that. Uh, it could be a multi-year cycle. Mm-hmm. And for that period, that's literally your driving force. That's what you're shooting for. But, but that amount of willpower of uh, any neurological capacities, handling stress, physiological load, uh, once the goal is attained or not, uh, there's a big, big downward swing. It, it's mm-hmm. like you can't yeah. maintain that same level. I mean, when you competed, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and I think that it's probably a smarter thing to do unless like, you have a, like, another big competition coming up. I think it's smarter to switch gear for mm-hmm. six months. Maybe not a year, but yeah. just, I mean, I remember like uh, Ilya Ilin. I was just about to say, yeah, he, he was the same brainwave. I was just about to mention that. Oh, sorry, go ahead. yeah. Alien, well, 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 of course, like, he, he got popped, but then again, yeah. everybody at that level at mm-hmm. that time was on, on stuff. Uh, anyway, so Ilya, after the Olympics, he would take a break of like four, six months. He would come back in training and, and his weight would be like 70% of what he was able to do before. But that just he, his speed was the same, his coordination was the same. And that's, I think that's a, that's a characteristic of, of high level athlete is that that's why they can actually take a break and still perform is that their motor skill acquisition and and the capacity to retrieve that store information once they get back to it is so great that they don't suffer from a loss of coordination skill or sports skill, even if they have a long layoff, okay? Which will not happen to the average person. So, so if an average person wants to be good at golf, for example, he probably doesn't have a choice but to keep mm-hmm. golfing. Uh, maybe reduce the amount of golfing he does, but still you need to practice that skill. Uh, otherwise, he will lose it. Uh, I know that personally, I've never been someone with great uh, motor skill permanency, if you want to call it that. I mean, I, I, I'm not very uh, movement literate. So I'm a small step above motor moron, but I have such a good understanding of biomechanics and how the body moves, and I'm a hard worker that I could actually make it work in many various sports. But if I stop practicing golf, for example, I stopped golf for a while, it took me a full year just to get back to swimming properly again. And I never was able to get back to the same level I was. Olympic weightlifting, I'm finding that, for example, I mean, I, I competed for several years. I trained that for several years. I find it's very hard to get my technique back, my, my position back. Which is not something that like uh, I, I've seen elite Olymp- Olympic lifters. A friend of mine, for example, who was uh, who had the Canadian record on a clean and jerk with 192 kilos in the old 82 kilos class. Uh, he was like 28 when he did that. Stopped training for about 20 years. Then I was coaching at the uh, Quebec Games of big weightlifting, and he comes in to visit because his old friends were coaching and stuff like that. And we were training, and there was 160 kilos on the bar. And without a warm up, he just cleaned that. <laughs> I mean, dude, <laughs> first of all, I would have done like probably 60 warm ups just mm-hmm. to be able to do it clean properly. But the guy was very high level, very high level of motor skill, and probably the capacity 
to, to maintain those more skills. We see that in CrossFit all the time. The best CrossFitters are those who don't need to practice their skills because that allows them to focus mostly on conditioning, mostly on strength and power in a general format. Or rather, someone with a lesser motor skill capacity will need to constantly practice muscle up, uh, bar muscle up, uh, Olympic lifts, snaps, being injured, every single day, like walking on your hands. So the, the workload required for those people mm-hmm. is such so much higher than they are at a big disadvantage compared to the more skilled CrossFit athlete. So I think that when we work with, with elite athletes, it's probably safe to assume that most of them has a very high level of, of both uh, skill mastery and the capacity to retrieve that stored skill. So I think that for them, taking a certain period off from their sport will typically do a lot more good than harm. And then it allows them to focus more on uh, healing. I mean, I was on a podcast with Dave Tate a moment, uh, like a few months ago. And one thing I mentioned was that we, we talk about programming, like for a training cycle, for let's say a peaking for a competition, but nobody talks about programming recovery cycles. Yes. And when I see recovery cycles, I'm not talking about, okay, we're going to deload or we're going to reduce training. Mm-hmm. That's not what I mean. I mean, you are actually like, for a certain period of time, let's say you beat up your body. I mean, if you're an elite athlete, even if you train properly, you will beat up your system. There's no way around it, right? Uh, even if you don't always feel it, there's some always some low-grade systemic inflammation going on. Uh, you might have caused some some tissue damage that is unresolved and so on and so forth, neurological fatigue. So after a certain period of stress, you should actually periodize a phase that the main interventions are not training. They are recovery methods uh, that can actually become in the form of supplements. Uh, it could be in the form of like deep tissue work, could be various form of, of let's say, ice baths, you know, you know, all, all those things, right? But they need to be paradise so that for, let's say, you have a, let's say a six weeks period, the goal is not train, but what you do is just you do everything humanly possible to fix any possible bad thing that might have happened during that last intense cycle. But people are so afraid of losing their gains that they don't do that and they stop progressing. But I'm telling you, if you do a four to six weeks period where you devote as much focus and thinking into designing a recovery program, then you do programming your performance program Dude, when you come back from that, you're going to be a freaking machine. Sure, it's going to take you two or three weeks just to get back in the groove of things, but in the long run, you'll reach a much, much higher peak. I mean, most, uh, I mean, a lot of, even we, we, we talked about uh, Ilya Ilyin, but uh, Lu Jai Jung did the same thing. I mean, it, it, I remember after the last Olympics, uh, he, he, he's not a big guy. I mean, he's super muscular, mm-hmm. but you can see the small frame. Then he looked like literally someone out of a concentration camp. Like he stopped training for about a year, didn't look like anything. And he could like barely deadlift two plates, like 100, 100 mm-hmm. kilos. But he got back into form. Then he got popped for uh, EPO, which is kind of stupid for a weightlifter. But anyway, yeah, I guess it's what you are doing, maybe. Yeah, that uh, yeah, that whole detraining training thing reminds you a little bit of that uh, the KCVA tour, like the Colorado experiment, where it's like, oh, he gained sixty pounds of muscle or something, but he also detrained like as much as someone could humanly detrain, and then you know, that's just... the that's the Pollican strategy. I mean, mm-hmm. Pollican once when he you, I mean, and Charles was a good friend of mine, so I'm not not dissing him, and I, I did the same thing when I started out. Is that he would claim, for example, uh, with this program or by taking magnesium. Uh, Chris Pronger in gained 12 pounds of muscle and lost 6% body fat in, in, in six weeks. And that actually happened. But what he doesn't tell you is that they spent nine months not training, playing <laughs> yeah. hockey, eating like crap on the road. Because yeah. back then, athletes, even today, they don't really train that hard in season. So every single hockey player I've ever trained always comes back at least 10 pounds with, with 10 pounds less muscle at the end of the season, but they, they regain it within four weeks. So I could look like a genius and do they gain 12 pounds of muscle in three weeks. My program works now, like just regaining the, uh, the, the, the muscle they lost from the detraining and the lack of protein because they just eat out at restaurants, they just don't eat properly. Today's podcast is sponsored by Team Builder. 
Team Builder is an online software for coaches and trainers, and I've continued to hear great things about the Team Builder platform. If you're looking for either an in-house training portal for your training groups or an online training hub, be sure to check out the Team Builder training software. Yeah, I think sometimes, like what you said, people don't, like how much time do we spend focusing on, you know, the you know, power training phase or strength phase or whatever different cycles. But like you said, no one talks about that transition or recovery period. And I've seen mm-hmm. like, like the true one where you don't either don't do anything or do very little or do a same but different or, and I've seen anywhere from like, I've seen swim groups that literally took one week off the whole year. So 51 weeks on one week off all the way up to, uh, you mentioned skill, Harry Mara, who's like a legendary decathlon, decathlon coach, uh, coached uh, Ashton Neaton and others. Uh, and I, I want to say he gave his athletes like it might have been months off. Like it was a long, long time. And but like you said, if those decathletes are so skilled, like it, like in the ability to retain and, and, you know, come back with skills. And I've, I've even seen athletes, too, like who like pole vaulters and working with them, they couldn't get like a certain uh, it was called a boob cut where you're like hanging uh, hands up from a bar and you swing your hips over that they couldn't get it, couldn't get it, took the summer off, came back and first day back, they like got it, you know? So it's like, well, what's going on there? But I, I, like you said, I just don't think we, we don't pay that credit as much as I think we could. I mean, on a base, it's very simple. Just go rest or do some different things. Or even like uh, Dan John talked about with like the Russians, like they would come back, like Victor um, Sanyev, the triple jumper, who won like three or four Olympics or something and triple jump. His base phase, you would read it. It's like game, 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 game. <laughs> like there's like, I think they just play volleyball or something, you know. But uh, yeah, we. Um, it's almost like like what I was thinking though is what you were saying is, is we almost our system ramps up in training to suppress like all those little things that would hold us back. So when in the year do we offer ourselves a chance to like let everything just settle? You know what I'm saying? Like and 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 being intentional about that. Problem with stress uh, and okay, and stress is basically it's not just the training stress. It, it's weird, but just like, like, I'm going to give you an example. And it's it's going to be an analogy, but it, it's going to I think explain the, explain the situation. Uh, someone one ha- once asked Jay Cutler when he was preparing for the Olympia, "What the first thing you're going to eat after your competition?" Like traditional bodybuilding question, and his answer was a steak. I don't have to wait. You see what, why it's the same steak as he was eating, but just the fact that like, I have to eat this and this exact amount that uh, imposes a stress on you. Hmm. It's not just eating that steak, for example, it's that you have to eat it that steak at that weight at that time. You have to follow the schedule. Same thing when you're training. So, uh, it's not just the actual work that causes the stress, it's the fact that this is the work you have to do. There's, I mean, you don't feel like doing it. You still have to do it. Uh, you might have some small adjustment, but that's pretty much what you have to do. You feel trapped. You feel like it's a job at one point. Mm. A- and psychologically, mentally, neurologically, that takes a lot out of you. Okay. It, it's uh, my, my wife, we were uh, in Colorado training uh, athletes there. And, and, uh, and a figure competitor that I trained for the Olympia was there. She was training and she was like super strict with her diet, like weighing everything. Mm. Um, and my wife told me, dude, there's just no way I could do what she's doing. That's just crazy to me. That's not, that's not sane. And I told her, Jen, you're actually eating less and better than she is. But you eat, the reason why it doesn't feel that way is that you still eat what you want to eat. But it just turns out that what you like eating is good for you. So what she didn't like was not the food she was eating. It's, it's a structure. It's you feel trapped and people who love variation, they don't like that. So that alone is stressful. So when you have a period of, let's say, uh, one, one, one thing I, I told a group of uh, soccer coaches last year about training is that you need to have periods of the year where they just do free play. I mean, it, it, it could be a structure similar to soccer or not. doesn't really matter. But you want still to have like teamwork involved and agility, changing the body. but just replay change the rule whatever so that it doesn't feel like the same entrapment so so i think that this is a big thing 
And, and that's why when you're training so is so regimented, you need period to let the steam up. That doesn't mean you don't you don't train. You can still train, but just you know what? Don't follow a plan. Like play or, or do something fun. And that that's also why I like seasonal training, like, like we talked yeah. about earlier. Is that I mean, once you've done a, a training cycle, you move on to something else. So it just, it's like a reset button. It just freshes your mind, fresh in your mind. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that, you know, we can't just approach it from the physiology. It's also like the mind because at fatigue, it's almost in many ways overtraining first happens in the mind. You know, we get bored or, or like in the associated neurotransmitters and all that stuff. And then it hits in the body or whatnot. You know, mental state, I mean, I was, it's funny because I was answering questions on my forum and Someone wrote, you know, hatred is the best pre-workout. And, and that's true. I mean, I, I, I remembered one time when I was pissed with my girlfriend. Dude, I probably benched 40 pounds more than my PR. I mean, you, you always have this untapped potential when you can, like, you get in the right mental state. Doesn't mean it has to be hatred. But the opposite is also true. If you are psychologically down, demotivated you don't like what you see you're whatever right you had a bad breakup it's gonna have a negative impact on your training same thing if you get bored that's where training monotony plays a big role i mean that's a big concept now you need to avoid training monotony which means that every like high level of monotony would be that every training session is fairly similar in intensity and load and the type of intervention. And when it's always similar, oddly enough, the risk of injuries increase. You'd think it's the opposite mm -hmm. because you're always doing the same thing. In reality, it, 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 the risk of injury dramatically increases, probably out of boredom, probably because you stop paying attention because you just like mail it in. You just rely on the autopilot instead of being intellectually involved. And then technique starts degrading. You stop paying attention to your inner signals telling you, dude, there's a red light flashing. You might like rest two minutes more, for example. So I think that variation is very important, uh, not just for different physiological gains, but to avoid monotony. Yeah. So that, um, you know, along with the monotony, one of the questions I had for you on the list, and I think this is a, I mean, it's funny how these things probably go in cycles over the years or decades, but the training to failure seems to be popping up again. Um, and that to me is interesting because I think there's also a mental component that I think has to play a really strong role in the people who have succeeded versus maybe those who might not get as much result or the, the, the mental types of those who were proponents of it or did very well. I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. 100%. 100%. I mean, um, I find that some people just can't hit true task failure. They will subconsciously fake themselves out. Hmm. That's why even studies looking at training to failure might actually be worthless in terms of intermittent the results because most of these studies are always uh, using beginners, okay? And beginners can't really reach true failure. They will always fake themselves out, and they're not trying to do it. It's the problem is that the moment they start to feel uncomfortable, the signal sent to the nervous system is so strong because mm. it's boring to them. <clears throat> it's a pain their body is not used to encountering. So it becomes a lot more inhibitory for them than for someone who's used to that type of stress. Remember the, uh, the, the factory example I gave earlier. When you start working there, the noise is deafening and it creates a lot of fatigue. You go home at night and you shut down. But mm. after a few months, I mean, it doesn't impact you as much. Uh, so when you have a study conduct conducted on beginners, they will have central fatigue a lot faster, and that shuts down their capacity to recruit the fast-twitch fiber. So even if they are hitting failure, it's not failure in a, tire, in a term of true muscular or task failure in which you would actually lead eventually to recruiting the fast-twitch fibers. That's why in bodybuilding, we say, or it's becoming popular to say, that going to task failure is superior for hypertrophy because those last few reps you're forced to use the fast switch fibers which will only be brought in when they are required so at first let's say you're using a weight that is 70 percent of your maximum it's not heavy enough to warrant the use of the fast switch fibers but after five or six reps 
you you probably cause something like 10 to 15% fatigue. It's roughly 3% per rep. Then you are forced to recruit a fast food fibers. And now the set become effective for growth. You need to recruit a fast food fibers for growth if you're natural. Uh, ironically, when you are using drugs, that's not true. because And that's something that people don't know, is that steroids tend to increase the development mostly of slow twitch fibers. But it, it's not necessarily a bad thing in terms of muscle growth because it basically means a slow twitch fiber, makes a slow twitch fiber similar to fast twitch fibers from a muscular development perspective. But that's also why uh, speed athletes, they would never run their fastest when they were using drugs. They would run faster after a cycle of drugs mm. when, they, the, for example, you would have, let's say a period, let's say the athlete is on for eight weeks. It, they would ha- it would have some form of conversion of the 2X fibers into the 2A fibers, mostly because of the drugs. And then when they stop that, you still didn't regain, you still maintain the neurological and muscular adaptation, but now there's a reconversion to the 2X when they, they take the drugs off and almost stop lifting. And then you have the, the circumpensation of the 2X fibers, and now they're faster, but they have not yet mm-hmm. lost the strength and power gain and the, the, of course, the drugs allow them to do more volume. So that anyway, but the point is that if he, someone is natural for a, from a bodybuilding perspective, you need to recruit the fast twitch fibers to get good hypertrophy. So you have two ways of doing that. Either you lift heavy, which is my favorite way of of, of, of training. Uh, it doesn't have to be maximum weight, but it has to be eighty percent or more, uh, and that's important. With heavy weights, you do not need to go to failure for a set to be maximally effective. Uh, right from the start, any rep that is done with 80% of maximum will recruit a fat which fibers and will be effective for growth. So it, it, let's say you do five like five sets of five with 80%, it's still probably like two reps in a thing, not, not close to failure, but every rep still counts for hypertrophy. Um, or you can do reps to failure. But then again, that should only be done on machines. I mean, yeah. doing squats, that's not super smart. Even back mm-hmm. press to failure, there will be a te- technique degradation. A- and yes, depending on the person, it does take a lot out of you. I mean, I- I- I've worked with some people, they just thrive on low volume to failure training. Okay. These tend to be more the type, like type 1As, uh, some type 2As, uh, basically people who, who have a very strong adrenergic response. Um, but other, it will actually cause too much stress for some people. Like for, for a 1B, for a type 3, uh, it's not a great approach. It will just be too neurologically draining. Uh, so yes, I've seen people who tried to train to failure. And even if they only did like two sessions a week for one set per muscle, they burned out completely. Uh, so, so that's a problem with saying that This is the best way to do things. I understand that from a a financial perspective, marketing perspective, you need to do that. But the reality is that, no, it doesn't necessarily mean that. Uh, Each human is different than the other. We have different hormonal system. We have different skeletal system, fascia, nervous system, neurotransmitters. There are so many different things that will impact a response to training. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting as you talk about that. I mean, I guess I have my own biases and the athletes I I don't I train athletes for um like speed and jumping and power and and those movement and those types of things. Um I haven't actually trained any bodybuilders and the only so the only experience I have is my own in that. And it's it's interesting. I've had uh, like for me my I wouldn't say I I gain size easily, but I've had two things like in arm size that have both been noticeable and are both on entirely different ends of the spectrum and you both mentioned them as one was I was, I really got into break dancing my senior year of high school and doing all these like explosive, like kind of elbow tucked moves. Like if you watch like someone doing a turtle, it's called a turtle. Like they're like spinning around and the only support is the elbows tucked into the ribs and the hands. So it's like these little explosive like movements. Nothing was ever to failure. It was just a lot more tension than I probably did doing bench press or something like that. And that got my, my, my triceps were noticeably bigger than even times when I was weightlifting doing that thing. But then on the flip side, I remember when I was about, 29 one guy at the cal gym he loved to run the rack like at, you know starting the 50s and you just goalie down to like the fives and i was so dead like i mean it was as close to failure as i've ever i mean just destroyed my arms could barely type 
And my arms grew fast doing that. I mean, like so much faster than other stuff. So it was almost like these two. But I one thing I want to mention, though. I want to mention one thing. And I'm not saying that what you're saying is not, it's not effective or muscle grain. Sure. But people also forget that these extreme methods will lead to a ton of local inflammation and yeah. edema. Mm. I've seen a lot of people, let's say you train hard. Then you you are forced not to train for a week, and you swear to God you get, you, you just lost ten pounds of muscle because you look so small. No, you just got rid of the edema and inflammation from previous session. That was not muscle; it was the illusion of muscle. But yeah, I think that one application of training to failure that with athletes that could be interesting, okay, is that if you go to failure, especially if you're using more machine exercises, more targeted movement, uh, you don't need a lot of sets or mm-hmm. volume, get the work done. So if you're an athlete, okay, uh, hypertrophy is, unless you're a football lineman, it's not really a goal, okay? I mean, if you're a 100-meter sprinter, you don't mm-hmm. want to be heavier. Even if that is muscle, you don't want you. I mean, you're going to accept the muscle gain if it comes from increasing power and speed. But just from doing isolation work, that's not a great thing for performance. However, there are some cases where uh, an athlete needs to bring up one specific muscle for injury prevention, for balance, and, and so on and so forth. And in that case, using one set to failure can actually bring you results. And that's just one small amount of addition to your workout, which you can probably recover from. Yeah. And that will not negatively impact the rest of what you're doing. I mean, uh, uh, an error for athlete would be, okay, you want to gain hypertrophy, so I'm going to use the same lifts I use to build strength, but for hypertrophy, I'm going to use higher rep squats, higher rep bench press, uh, higher rep chin-ups. Dude, that, that is what will be the problem because that will increase the overall stress so much, and it will create so much inflammation, so much muscle damage, so much neurological fatigue that it will impact your sport. But if you keep most of your training using strength, power, exercises, but just for the specific muscle you need to bring up, use machines with very low volume and to failure, that allows you to do the hypertrophy where you need it without depleting the other resources. Today's podcast is sponsored by the Plyomat. The Plyomat is a jump testing device that allows you to instantly receive ground contact times, jump heights, reactive strength measurements, and more in your training populations. It's easy to use, accurate, and affordable. And an awesome feature that I love about the plyo mat is it easily allows the connection of not just one mat, but you can string multiple mats together for use in things like multi-hurdle hops and bounding situations. I absolutely love the plyo mat, recommend it. And to check it out, you can head to plyomat.net. That's P-L-Y-O-M-A-T dot net. Yeah, that that's exactly like I, I if I was to do like max squats or deadlifts, it would have had too harsh of a like stress effect. But like the little muscle groups are always fine. I remember there was one day we had a Kaiser calf raise, like a pneumatic calf raise, so you could adjust it just with the little button. I did I remember one day I was doing like drop sets, like so just calf calf drop sets on it and the next day I felt surprisingly springy, you know, like, cause it's just this little, it's calves, you know, it's going to recover a lot quicker than like taking squats to the house or whatever. And so it was always interesting thinking about where, yeah, like, even like you said, machines, like that was like, you're locked in, you know, like a machine versus like heavy free weight loaded, you know, things that have a higher stress threshold to them. So it's, I think yeah. that the problem is trying to do everything at the same time with a method. For example, if you need something to be fixed in an athlete, use the method and exercise best suited to do the job. Like the squat might be the best l- way to build strength in the lower body. Might be, not always, but th- that's, a good, that's a good movement. But I wouldn't use that if my goal was to hypertrophy the leg of an athlete. Okay. Uh, so, so it's same thing if like the bench press could be a good strength movement for pressing, but if I want an athlete to improve his spectral development for some reason, I don't know why I would, but again, uh, I wouldn't use the bench press. I would keep the bench press for what it's good for in a program, which is strength. And then I'm going to use a more targeted exercise to build the muscle I want to build. I mean, I think it's a mistake to try to do everything with the same tool. Each tool has its purpose. 
Like, don't try to nail uh, a nail with a saw. That just doesn't work well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know, you know, with the fatigue, uh, something we've talked about this before a little bit with like uh, some of the neurotyping and like some of the pre-fatigue or sensation where athletes doing not a fatiguing, but like, you know, a semi-fatiguing set of something and then doing their sports skill, maybe that offers them a different sensory experience, a different muscular experience. And that's something I've been playing with a lot. Uh, even uh, Chris Corfus, a uh, sprint coach, was on uh, probably about six months ago talking about doing like hip flexor, like 30 to 40 second hip flexor exercises in a circuit, and then they'd go sprint. And it's funny because, you know, if that was me 15 years ago and I heard that, I'd be like, oh, you can't, you can't fatigue the hip flexors and then go, you know, but like if it's a littler muscle group or a smaller, you know, if you're stimulating it in not a, you know, sprint manner, maybe it's a different manner. Uh, I think there's different ways the body can recover from that. So I was just curious um, if you had any uh, extended thoughts on like how uh, would pre-fatigue for you go beyond just bodybuilding, like, like applications into Olympic lifting or, or explosive training. I'd be curious to hear those. Of course, because you, as, as, you, as you mentioned, like what you do before an exercise or before a movement will impact that movement itself. I mean, if you look at pre-fatigue, I think first, okay, we're going to use pre-fatigue because that's the term, being, the term being used. I don't like it when it comes to athletes because the goal is not to fatigue a muscle. Yeah, yeah. It would be to pre-activate a muscle. Yeah. So for example, if you do non-fatiguing work, for a, a muscle uh, that will increase the synaptic facilitation. You can actually, uh, at the synaptic level, your synapses are more sensitive to the neural drive. One, when I was working with bodybuilders, one way of doing that would be, for example, let's say you're doing a seated row, you want to increase your lats recruitment, just hold the contracted position and focus on contracting your lats as, as hard as you can for, let's say, 15 seconds. Then you're going to do your reps. Automatically, your lats will fire will fire up a lot more. Uh, but you can use the same principle if an athlete needs to have one muscle firing more in a certain skill. For example, I'm going to use myself as an example because I'm doing this right now. But I'm going back, I'm getting back to the Olympic lifts and my main issue was the catch of my snatch. First, because my shoulder mobility is not what it used to be, but also because I was not actively contracting my upper back to catch the load. One thing that people should no, when you're receiving a snatch overhead, it's you should see it as it's your upper back catching the weight. Like you are retracting and contracting all that meaty rhomboids, mid-back traps, area, area, and that's what is stabilizing the shoulders. And I was not doing that. So it was like, in fact, because of the the time spent doing bro work and bench press work, my shoulders were now more forward. So the whole upper back was lengthened. So when I'm in the catch position, it was actually not only not contracted, it was lengthened. So I had no overhead stability, none whatsoever. So what I'm working on right now is before doing snatches, I'm doing bend pull-aparts. And I'm really focusing on squeezing that upper back. And dude, I, this morning, I had my best technical snatch session like in a long time because I really felt that mid-back lighting up. It was a lot better. But you can do for the same thing. Let's say, for example, that I'm going to stick with the Olympic kids for right now, but I'm going to move on to other exercise afterward. But let's say you, you're doing a, a, a clean, and the problem you're clean or snatch is that you can't bring the bar to your hips. The bar stays away from your body when you're lifting. So to keep the bar close, what you do is that you bring your punch your hips toward the bar, and then the bar travels forward. That's a very common mistake, especially in CrossFit athletes. Right? What you want is you want the bar to get into the hips. So when you explode up, there is some contact, but the goal is not to punch the hips forward to get contact, okay? That will just have a bad bar path. So the problem is you can't keep the bar close to your body when you're lifting it from the floor, and especially when you're passing the knees. And that is entirely dependent on having the lats fire. So you're try trying to actively like pull your arms back like this. The lats are firing to keep the bar close. Same thing on a deadlift. Uh, so if you're doing, for example, just straight arm lat pull, Straight arm lat pull downs before uh, uh, a deadlift, you are lighting up that movement pattern, right? So when you're switching into your clean, automatically you do it. And the closer both are together, the more transfer there is. And now for uh, like jumping and stuff like that, I was talking to uh, Ben Trentis last week because we are working on a seminar together, on a book together. Ben works mostly with high level NHL players. 
and some NFL players. And he was telling me about uh, one uh, complex he uses to instantly boost the uh, athlete's vertical jump by like, uh, I, I it was like something like 5%. I don't know why. I don't know the, the exact number. And I, I, I don't remember the exact complex. I'm, I, I know you want to take note, but I don't know. I don't remember. It was like five exercises, five different types of jumps. I know that there was one with the, the flywheel, uh, I, I quarter squad of the, the flywheel. I know that it was uh, some eccentric overload. I know that it was some uh, uh, isometric uh, squats. There was a triple jump in there. I don't know exactly. Remember the exact complex. I'm going to have to ask him. But every single person, once they did that, they jumped like something like three centimeters higher. And they, were, uh, they all freaked out. And it's not that they it increased their capacities by three centimeters. It, it's that they, they unlocked something. Uh, and when you use exercises that stimulates something you need to be good at a skill, but at non-fatiguing level, it will potentiate performance. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that activation versus fatigue. Because like, yeah, even those, like the hip flexor swings for 20, 40 seconds, they're not going to be completely, it's, it's fatig- a little fatigue, but it, by the time you hit your next sprint or set, you're good enough that you have a little like activation sensation, a different experience, and you're good to go. I remember one but time... Hey, just one thing, sorry. Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, because I forget, I'm getting old. Uh, but you know, some muscles will actually benefit from some fatigue, like the flexors. Sure, they are important to bring the leg back to have a, a higher stride frequency. But if they're too tight, they reduce the, the capacity to apply force downwards, like when you're pressing into the floor. And it probably means that you're going to, when you bring the leg back because it's tight, it will, you, it will rotate slightly. So now you're out of the groove. So creating a small amount of fatigue mm-hmm. in the flexor while also activating them is like they ma- like they're like almost magic. Yeah, so, no, that that's a good point too. And it kind of now I almost forgot what I was going to say, but that's okay. I, I it, you got me thinking about something called like uh, the term is called redundancy in motor learning. It's basically like how many ways can the body do the same task? Like basically, if I'm sprinting, in what specific fatigue patterns can I carry out sprinting? Maybe there's a slight fatigue of the, you know, hip flexors, iliacus, rectus femoris, whatever. Maybe the psoas has to work harder, you know, or whatever it is. And so it's interesting to think about giving the body um, different experiences there. One of the things I've actually, I've been using with that in mind is going into some of these workouts, like a, like a sprint workout with these, um, like extra exercises in there. Maybe it's a hip flexor exercise. And actually thinking, I want to finish this sprint workout, not just with a good time, but I also want to feel, and the athlete to feel like their hip flexors were just really worked, you know, because sometimes you go through workouts and again, neurological, you don't it's not about the muscle per se, but at the same time, you do have these key movers, like Asafa Powell's hip flexors were massive, you know, and so there is something I think about also coming out of these workouts, like I were I really hit this muscle group, or even like I've been just going through the, the old uh, Gals Cometti, like the the old like contrast training from the eighties and nineties. He had all sorts of amazing combinations in there with like different lifts combined with uh, jumps and movements. And I think sometimes if we're almost so pure with the neuro- neurological, like oh you can only sprint, you can't put anything else in there, and it has to only be this. I think there's a lot of benefit in dumping just little, you know, bits of activation and fatigue. It's like a mixture, you know, you're at this little chemistry set. Yeah, you can even use like true pre-fatigue. Like if you have a muscle that's overactive during a movement and that's messing up with you over your technique, then Mm. fatiguing that muscle will reduce its capacity to pull against you. So that's another strategy you can use. You can use fatiguing or activating to change the movement pattern. If you activate a muscle, it will participate more. If you fatigue a muscle, it will participate less. So if you understand a movement really well, and you understand which muscles do what in that movement, you can think, you know what? That technical issue I'm seeing, maybe it's not because of poor technique, but it's because one muscle is overactive versus what it needs to be, and one is underactive versus what it needs to be. So you can try to reverse that and then practice the skill. You might not have to do any technical correction. Just changing that activation fatigue ratio in some muscles might self-correct the technique. Yeah. As you were talking, actually, I had written this down is that 
sometimes these exercises just pop in my head as I'm like listening to you and like the um, the one I have in my mind is what if uh, you're on a football field and you do a reverse sled drag for like 50 yards, 100 yards, and you get the quads pretty good. But then you go do a tempo sprint down and back for 200 yards with that quad fatigue sitting in there. So now you have to, if you hear, you know, oh, use your quads too much, and you sprint, you know, use your glutes enough or hamstring. I'd be curious how that might change things. And honestly, even sometimes I've gone to track practice after I squatted a little too hard the day before and my quads were just feeling it. And it but you still, you got bounced still because you're upright. You're not in that squat position, you know, and you have to manage it. So um, I was going to say the, 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 with the total fatigue though, I did this one time. Um, this was, I was reading like a Franz Bosch book about, I think, yeah, a little pre-fatigue and that type of thing. And I had this crazy idea that we had a vertical jump, a uh, vertex at Cal. And so I went through the process of uh, left leg calf, just total fatigue calf raises. Cannot do a single another calf raise, go jump. It actually wasn't that bad. Okay, do the same thing on my right leg. Of course, this is gastroc more than soleus. Maybe kneeling calf or bent knee might have been a different story. Right leg, gastroc, fatigue, same thing, not terrible. I'm like, okay, well, maybe I'm using a different strategy. I don't know, maybe that muscle isn't that important. Go. Then I go um, single leg, uh, like hip thrust, like back on a bench. Uh, left glute, which is my, my last step is my left leg, which is the straighter leg. So go through left leg glute fatigues. Like I have people pushing on my hips to try to like just totally wreck this left glute. Go and jump. It's still not terrible. Then I do the right glute and I couldn't even barely get off the ground. Like, cause my right leg was the one that was like the more bent. If you plant like one leg is straighter and one leg is on a running jump, one leg's more bent. I could barely even like, that was like almost fell on my face. I was like, ah. Oh, that's where that is. And in yeah. Yeah, finally, I found something that really like is in, so, but it also made me think with the calves, the, I, this, I don't know if this is Jay Schrader or who it was. It was this guy, DB, DB Hammer was the pen name, wrote this book and, and, uh, Brad, 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 Brad Nuttall. Yeah, no, yeah, that's who I think. Yeah, that's the conspiracy theory. I think that that's likely. <laughs> I, I, I would follow that trail for sure. Um, but but there was something in there about icing calves, like before plyometrics for that reason, like I guess because it makes the all the elastic tissues in the leg and foot work more and you can't use. But then I was like, well, when I pre-fatigue my calves, I could still jump okay off, you know, two legs. So maybe there's something there. I thought that was interesting. So that was... When you think about, it, when you think about the calves, okay, how much of that explosion is actually due to the muscle belly contracting? Mm-hmm. I would I would argue that it's mostly stretch reflex of the Achilles. That that's mm-hmm. probably what's going on. So in that sense, I don't think that fatiguing the muscle itself would negate performance that much. Probably not at all. Okay, so that that's what I'm going with it. Yeah, I think there's some probably some redundancy in there too. Like you know, it's like all right, maybe I got my gas struck, but when I take off, I'm twisting my leg, so it's. Some lateral aspects can kick in, some solia, you know, some other stuff. And body will like always said, adjust the movement yeah. pattern, optimize the task it needs to do. I mean, you need to go from A to B. And that's why I believe in either activation or pre fatigue as a way, a tool of technical correction, because the body will automatically adapt the movement pattern to what it has. So I, I need to do go from here to here. What is the most physiologically or biomechanically efficient way of getting there? The body will do that. And that's also why when I, I train athlete, I prefer to use a whole body approach. Because as much as possible, unless I have diagnosed some overactive and underactive muscles, I want the fatigue to be as even as possible. Because if you go, let's say you, you have a, a, a upper body session, whatever, okay? Even though you're thinking of running only in terms of lower body, the upper body is significantly involved. So if you have a huge amount of fatigue in the upper body and some soreness and some decrease in mobility, you go sprinting, the body will figure out, I need to mm-hmm. tweak some motor pattern. So your motor pattern becomes less effective, less efficient. Uh, so, but if you fatigue everything equally, it probably doesn't need to change a pattern as much. Yeah. You might perform as well but you maintain the same movement pattern. Now, you could argue that in some sports, you want the capacity to easily adapt to small changes. I would argue that for football or or sports where you don't only run linearly under the same conditions, you probably want to sprint 
in as many different states as possible. Because you're not going to have always uh, the, the same footing. You're not going to always have uh, the same weather, whatever, the change in directions. So, so you need to be able to make those adaptations. But if you are a pure sprinter, you want as much as possible to repeat the exact same action under the exact same condition as much as possible. Yeah. With sprinting and track and feel like the 400 is almost like nature's classic observation of fatigue and then what happens. Like you hit that 300 meter mark, you know, you've been, you're starting in lactate land and some muscle groups are starting to be like, oh, I don't know about this. And you have to find the body through, you know, redundancy in some cases, I think has to find almost adapt to the strategy of the evolving fatigue state of the body. Sometimes we don't think about it that way, but I, I like to think about it that way. The cool thing with the 400 <clears throat> is also, I mean, if you do it a decent amount, but not, not a single sprint, but let's say like four sprints, uh, you will be sore the next day. And the muscles you're sore are likely the muscles that need more work. Mm. So that's a pretty good diagnostic tool on top of the technical diagnostic tool. Yeah, I, I love that. That reminds me of, um, I was hanging out with uh, T Tommy John uh, doing some, just like Jay Schrader type stuff. Like, like he, the first exercise he has me do is 100, stand on one leg and the other leg do 100 circles with the foot in front of you, 100 circles the other way side the back he's like the first muscle that gets tired is the one you the weak leg you need more work and i'm like my hip is blowing up right now like my glute medius or something in there like i was like a third of the way through and i was already getting destroyed and that would, i would have i had swimmers do it actually once and their interior foot intrinsic foot was the biggest like getting and of course they don't really need that to be good at swimming in fact they almost don't need it in some ways to have a flippy you know like foot but i, I always found but objective about I mean, the, the, the data you're looking at doesn't mean you need to correct that problem. Yeah. You need to evaluate, is it needed for my sport? Yeah, yeah. I love that 400 anecdote, though, with the, the muscles that are sore. I just think, because it, it is so easy. We live in such a, I mean, I think a lot of it's good, but, you know, data, the world is data. And, and does the research project say this? And does, you know, is this the best standard of practice for this training? And yet, I think that can sometimes cause us to lose a little bit of touch with that like organic piece like like what you just said like what's the athlete feeling after this workout how can that be my guidepost for creativity in, in obviously in conjunction with the standards and good practices but what how the athlete feels in my opinion is something that all coaches should look for when mm -hmm. I, even when i'm coaching athletes like uh, like uh, online coaching they always every every day they always have to send me three numbers their body weight, they're on a liquid scale of 1 to 10. Uh, how good did they feel on that day? 10 being great, 1 being suicidal. And on a, again, on the same scale of 1 to 10, um, how do they evaluate the quality of their workout, their perceived quality of the workout? So how they felt was not how they felt during the workout. It's just the overall sensation of the day and then the quality of the workout. And when I see too often like sixes, then I know that the volume load or the intensity is mismanaged. It, it's not mm. adapted to a diabetic. Maybe I, I just made mistakes programming. Maybe he has some life stress. Maybe his um, nutrition is not adequate. In fact, one thing I noticed is that when, I all, when they get like fives, so that's feeling pretty bad, their body weight is always down by three or four pounds in the morning. And, and we're not talking about athletes trying to lose weight. So it's like you're, they, they're just eating for performance, eating normally. And all of a sudden, their, their body weight drops by three or four, uh, four, four pounds. And that happens to me also. If I wake up and I'm three pounds lighter than the next day, than the previous day, my workout's going to be really bad. And, and my, what I'm thinking is that is probably loss of electrolytes. Uh, and I think that electrolytes is what athletes should be supplementing with, first and foremost. Uh, it's involved in so many different muscle actions, and most athletes will be deficient in many of them because they're sweating so much. They're sweating so much, and if you have a high-protein diet, you're probably urinating a lot also, so you're also flushing electrolytes. And I believe that sodium is not a problem most of the time. Potassium, magnesium, mostly magnesium is the big issue. I personally take three types of magnesium. Uh, during the day, I would take magnesium orotate, uh, but that's 
to be fair, mostly because of it's good for the heart. Uh, then the overtape chalate is good for the heart. Uh, then after a workout, so the overtape is done, it, it's in the morning. Uh, after the workout, I'm, I'm using uh, torate, magnesium torate, because torate or taurine is a neurological equalizer. Basically, if, if you're too high, it will bring you down. If you're too down, it will bring you up. So it, it, that's why they put it in energy drinks. It's actually to avoid side effects of overactivation, like dying of a heart attack while playing high soccer. And, and also, it calms you down once you get amped up, so you buy another energy drink. Uh, but magnesium taurate, magnesium dislodge the adrenaline from its receptors, and the taurine will rebalance all those neurotransmitters. And in the evening, I will use either magnesium glycinate or biglycinate or magnesium trionate. Uh, I tend to use magnesium trionate because I use glycine by itself in the evening. It's literally, I'm super, super happy that research is catching on about glycine. I, I've seen some studies showing the, the benefits of glycine. I've been using it for 20 years. It's an amino acid. It calms the brain down. It acts like a neurological inhibitor. It also increases serotonin level. So if you want to put yourself in a relaxed mode at the end of your day, that's the best supplement you can use with magnesium. That's literally the best combination. All the athletes I work with have to take that. So you don't have to take three different magnesium, but, but certainly you need magnesium in your diet. Also, uh, it's better to have more smaller bolus doses of magnesium during the day than one larger one. Because magnesium is where the weight's absorbed in that higher quantities have a much smaller percentage of absorption. So yeah, you, you, if you have 1,000 milligrams, you're going to absorb more than if you take in 250. But if you take 250 four times a day, you're going to absorb a lot more magnesium than 1,000 at one time. Christian, I, I need to ask you this before I forget because it's been, I think it's been a last question on maybe three podcasts of ours that I just never got to, that I always wanted to ask. you. And so uh, before we run out of time, uh, loaded stretching. I, I know you've written about this in your books and the books I have from you. Um, I'm you mentioned Jay Schrader. I'm fascinated with this stuff, like the extreme ISO lunge, like pulling down to the bottom and those types of things. Um, tell me your experience with uh, loaded stretching work and then a little bit about how you program it for athletes. I started using loaded stretching pretty much uh, when I first heard about Jay Schrader using it. And I saw like the original Freak of Training DVD, like back when we had DVDs, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. so I was still playing football, I think, or we're just starting coaching. Uh, so that, that's where I first learned about uh, loaded stretching. And then I started using it myself for myself and also with uh, two pro athletes I was working with, run, uh, running back and a, 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 a lineman. And what I noticed is that, well, I was using it to improve range of motion, first, first and foremost, because uh, the one had problem reaching a good position in the squat and, and the snatch. So we figured we're going to do like push-up isometric holds. Uh, uh, so loaded stretches. Uh, and what I found was that his chest got massive mm. just from that. Okay. And that's, that's when I became a lot more interested in loaded stretching. Because to, at first, I saw it as the most effective way of increasing active range of motion uh, or active mobility. So, so to me, that was my, my buy-in into it. But it's not something that I would use all the time because to me, you use mobility work if you need mobility. But once I figured out, you know what? It actually builds muscle. Uh, then I got really interested in it. So I started researching it more. And, and you know, bodybuilders have been using it probably even before Jay was using it. Uh, Chuck Sipes, who was Mr. Universe in, or Mr. America in 67, I think, his main upper back exercise or lat exercise was just hanging from a chin-up bar with a 100-pound dumbbell oh, for wow. a minute. That, that was his, his, his number one lat exercise. It was actually in the program. Uh, but gymnasts were using it. Um, so it's something, and Don Perillo was using a form of it, but it was mostly like you pump a muscle, then you stretch it, but it's similar. Uh, and that became something that has been a cornerstone of my program ever since. Now, how do I use it? Uh, it depends on what I'm using it for. Uh, for example, with a power lifter, or a strength athlete, we might use it to strengthen tendons in those key positions. 
uh, I, I often use it with a CrossFit individual to increase uh, their strength or their mobility in certain position. I had this uh, former college swimmer uh, that had the typical uh, interior shoulder posture, and he was doing CrossFit now. Ironically, he, was, he, he is still a chiropractor and one of the top uh, shoulder guys in, in, in North America, works with many pro baseball teams. Anyway. Uh, so he just couldn't do a overhead squat, and he was doing CrossFit. Uh, and with overhead stre- with, with uh, loaded stretching, we got him to full snatch in a session. Mm-hmm. He had been working on his shoulder mobility for years, mm-hmm. so it's super powerful. So you can use it for a mobile as a mobility exercise, which would be done at the beginning of the session, so that you can actually hit those positions you need to hit. I do it with my own training. Because I need more uh, over end mobility, I need more front rack mobility. So I do those exercises loaded before my workout, and uh, it, it just in three sessions, I went from barely about having the bar here to doing a full snatch. So it's 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 magic. It's really really effective. But you can also use it for a different reason. You can use it to build muscle. In which case, I would use it at the end of the session, once all the strength or even hypertrophy work has been done. I like with bodybuilders, I like to use it as a post failure method. So, for example, you do dumbbell presses, you reach failure or close to it, and you're going to go down, you're going to pull yourself, pull with your back, you're going to hold that for as long as tolerable. I used that with Daryl G when he competed at the Olympia a few years ago. So, uh, depending on it, it's such a versatile tool. I mean, it can even increase fast switch recruitment. The capacity to recruit faster fibers, which is some money that it actually is extremely counterintuitive when you think about it, because you no know, fast switch is associated with heavy weights with speed, short duration. Okay, a loaded stretch is nothing but anything but right. It's slow because there's no movement or very little movement, uh, and it's long. It's long duration, so technically you would see why well, it's more slow twitch fibers. And it's, yes, it's loaded, but it's not super heavy, at least not, not most of the time. So there's no reason why the faster fibers would dominate. But what actually happens is the two things that blocks oxygen from entering the muscle the best are muscle contraction. When the muscle contracts, it compresses the capillary, so blood cannot come in, and so oxygen cannot come in, and metabolites cannot come out. And also stretching. When you're stretching a muscle, you are preventing blood from coming into that muscle. So when you do a loaded stretching, the muscle is contracting and it's being stretched, so oxygen cannot come in. What fiber, which fibers require oxygen? The slow twitch fibers. If I'm depriving my muscle from oxygen, what do you think happens? By default, the body will use the fast twitch fibers, the only ones that can use, uh, that produce energy without oxygen or efficiently without oxygen. So, so it actually is a great way to program your brain to use the fast switch fibers. And it's a great way of doing volume work for the fast switch fibers because what, what doing typical lifting, yeah. if you try to do volume, you'll get that 2X to 2A conversion, which you don't want. With loaded stretching, I don't think that happens. Uh, and also you are uh, strengthening that lengthened position, which makes you stronger in that weaker and more dangerous position. It's literally a, a, a training method that every single mm-hmm. athlete should do. Yeah. Yeah, oh, 100 percent. I when you um, if using it for more of the strength values, uh, and oh, well, well, I'll just say this real quick first is the it made me think as well as of PNF stretching or the proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation, where I think static st- st- static stretching static stretching gets such a bad rap. I think we're like sometimes we almost are dismissive, but I've found PNF. Uh, sometimes I have to remind myself how good PNF stretching is. You know, it's like this is so good. Like, and I I stop using it. Because I was just like, oh, static stretch, you know, and for whatever, I, I think for better or worse, you know, there's certainly pros and cons, but um, yeah, I just, I just thought that was, you know, interesting or whatever. But I, I, yeah, just quickly, a couple minutes left is for like a strength protocol and adding weight and time. Um, any thoughts there just before we... Well, one uh, uh, weird, it's not pure limited stretching, but it's a method I use, I remember, okay, the, the, the moment, the period of my life when I had the greatest, the fastest rate in bench press stringing, because everybody knows the bench press is the most mm-hmm. important exercise ever. 
I was working in in, in St. Louis back then uh, at the Central Institute for Human Performance, reading blues players, some of the Rams players. And uh, I was experimenting with, with different methods because that's what I do. And I was doing this complex because I always do complexes. That's my brain is wired to do complexes. Even now, even I'm training in core strength, it's still complexes. So what I did, and that led to the greatest gains in bench press I've ever had, okay, was top half, close grip bench. So obviously heavier than my, my, normal, rep, my, my normal weight for three reps. Then on the dips, going to the, the lowest possible position and doing bounces. Mm. I, I keep pulling myself down to initiate a stretch reflex and just rebound and down and rebound and up. I would rebound and pull myself down like, aggressively. Like, yeah. I'm not sure my shoulders could handle it right now, but aggressively. Dude, I got so freaking strong, so fast. It was amazing. So it's something that I've actually used with powerlifters. Same thing for just with dumbbells. You just go down and you get that loaded stretch position. But once you're there, you're going to like pull down to initiate a stretch reflex and let your dumbbells rebound up. Then pull down, rebound up, pull down, rebound up. Obviously, you need to have resilient shoulders already to do that. But but I find, and that's, a, of course, that's an example on a bench, but it can be done on uh, the push-ups. It can be done on split squats. Mm -hmm. But just those little rebound reps, it's not really stretching, but actual, what actually happens is because of the momentum, you find yourself going deeper and deeper and deeper. So I would say it's an advanced version of loaded stretching. It would be loaded ballistic stretching. Yeah. Hey, you with the complex. Oh, that's awesome, by the way. I, I love it. Just that opens a gateway to so many combinations of movements. It's like, and then, and, and it just goes into, I, I wish we had more time, but like just that polarity, like on one end of the poles, you have pure tension. On the other end, you have length, max length and time under length. And there's so many just different iterations that a creative mind, or really, I mean, any mind can, um, we all have creativity, uh, can, can utilize. And, you know, certainly with you mentioning complexes, I was like, you know, with your library of knowledge, I would always use complexes, you know, like just doing two sets of 10 would be pretty boring. <laughs> What is the least complex of what I'm doing? It's what I'm doing right now. So let's say my workout, I would do uh, squat, snap, actually squat with weight releasers, power snatch, and snatch press. And But I do that as a circuit. So mm -hmm. it's a circuit more than a complex, but you still have the explosive work, the overall eccentric overload. Uh, and all my workouts are designed like that. But just I, I get bored if mm -hmm. I'm doing only one type of task. Uh, but and again, I, I, once you once you've tried complexes, you just don't go back. Yeah, I was talking to uh, to Prentice about this, and he's also using pretty much all complexes now, because especially with athletes who have also have the requirement for some uh, energy systems work and the sustainability of their strength and power, complexes like check that box also. Yeah. With a lot of my own personal like sprint and jump work, it's the same thing. You know, always trying to do different iterations, different combinations. Um, but man, I wish we had more time to chat, Christian, but really good stuff today. I really enjoyed chatting with you. I have a whole page of notes and uh, a lot of good ideas brewing in my head. So thank you so much for your time. And, and I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks for tuning in to another episode and I'll see you next week.